Gunther, can you see everybody? I can, yes. I have a good uh, panoramic view. <laughs> okay, well, welcome to our seminar here at Harvard Thank you. for Learning and Retirement. And it's a pleasure, pleasure to be here to join you on this. So. Well, we're excited to have you here because we've been studying a part of your history and Harvard's history for the last uh, going on now 11 weeks. And you're a major part of that early period at Harvard studying psychedelics and what is now becoming quite almost, I won't go so far as to say mainstream, but it's getting to be uh, a palatable topic without being <laughs> classified as a, a radical. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's earned commercial interest. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so and, you know, in the, uh, in this country, that, that seems to drive a lot of conversations. <laughs> anyway, yes. Well, as you know, um, you I gave you uh, access to what we've looked at. So I'm happy to know that you've seen some of the materials that we've covered. Yes, I, I've gone through it in depth. And uh, I want to say at the, uh, at the outset, I want to give a shout out to Ed for the uh, depth and breadth of the research, uh, the scholarship. Uh, it's so comprehensive and so much detail. Uh, I'm really, uh, I really appreciate what you've done there. And I just want, as I say, I want to give you a little shout out at the, at the beginning of this uh, event today to, uh, to honor what you've done with that. It's really first rate. Well, Thank you very much, and I just want to say that these uh, young folks behind me have uh, kept me on my toes. So, you know, <laughs> my work has been to, to keep these guys, you know, interested. So, well, I have fond memories of Cambridge. You know, I uh, I lived in Cambridge from 1960 to uh, 89. Uh, I'm uh, most of the time was spent uh, on Avon Hill Street. I had a lovely home there uh, on the corner of Upland Road and Avon Hill. And uh, partook of the uh, many opportunities in Cambridge and Boston area. And my uh, children and grandchildren still live in the area, actually, in Needham and Dedham. So I have occasion to visit occasionally. Although in recent years with COVID, I haven't been traveling that much. Anyways. Well, I, oh. I, I, I want to say that we were excited when I first reached out to you, and I want to thank you for your reception of my cold call. But you, there was a period of time then before you um, had a little bit of a bout with uh, some of the medical issues you were dealing with that you were actually going to attend uh, in person here. Yeah. Yes, I actually had considered that uh, and would have combined it with a trip to visit my family. Uh, but it didn't work out that way. Uh, I had uh, had what was a serious automobile accident, and then uh, uh, another fall at home, uh, which you know created a uh, fairly severe case of TBI, which I'm still dealing a little bit with that. And uh, and it turned out that the you know the basis for all of that was that I needed a pacemaker. So uh, basically, since uh, since July, I've been uh, in a healing mode, pretty much. You know, although I'm, I'm, as you can see today, I, you know, I, my vitality is coming back, and uh, I'm still vertical and reasonably lucid. So, uh, <laughs> you look very happy good. to do. You look very good. I, I, I thought I'd jump into our our first question, and I gave you a little preview of what I wanted to start with, and and it really starts with the person of uh, Timothy Leary, because a lot of uh, our discussions and through the period of uh, 1960 through probably 1974, uh, his persona became a, um, in my estimation, almost a caricature because he played to the media, he played to the camera, he played to the news, mm -hmm. he played to that, he was a showman. He also, in later years, called him a, 
um, kind of a, a showman philosopher. So one of the things that's really crucial, at least for me, and I think some of the group is, in the early period, from 1959, when you came in from London and came to Harvard to work with Henry Murray, and in the early days when everybody was still in the Brooks Brothers suits, <laughs> your first impression of Timothy as a person, as a character, could you comment on these early, before the showman <laughs> showed up? Sure. Well, I'm happy to. Uh, Timothy, I was assigned to Timothy. He was my faculty advisor. I didn't know who he was. Uh, I, as an undergraduate at Kenyon College, I majored in psychology and philosophy. I didn't have a lot of exposure to the type of research that Tim was noted for in the field of psychology, which was personality assessment. So when I came to Harvard uh, in 1960, in the fall, I had spent the previous year in Europe, in Norway, on a, on a Fulbright Fellowship. So I was able to lay my... Uh, my admittance to Harvard for a year because of that Fulbright. I had a meeting with Tim, uh, which is normal in you know in the fall. Uh, the summer before, I had arrived in Cambridge the summer before and had worked with uh, Harry Murray as an intern, uh, doing basically some relatively medial coding work on the TAT, the thematic app perception test that he developed which is very well known in the field of, of uh, diagnostic psychology. So I had a meeting with Tim in what turned out to be like a utility closet on the first floor of uh, what was appropriately uh, named uh, the uh, Center for Research and Personality. But it, it, uh, it had a very interesting connection because the, the street was, was Divinity Avenue, actually. <laughs> you know, so at 5 Divinity Avenue, which, you know, I didn't recognize at the time was probably, you know, a bit of a uh, of an omen, if you will. But anyway, I had this meeting with him in, in what was had been a converted utility closet. And it turned out he really didn't want to be, uh, he wanted to be closer to the students and closer to the, maybe to the front door of the building. But uh, anyway, uh, I found him to be very present, very uh, very charming, very intelligent, uh, a really good listener. Uh, he was very engaging. And he said to me at the very beginning, uh, I, need, I want you to know something, Gunther, that last summer, this past summer, I was in Cuernavaca, Mexico, and uh, he told me the story of taking the, the mushrooms there and his experience, uh, and that he, again, it was quoted publicly as saying, I learned more about psychology in that five-hour session than I did in all my professional years. And he said, that's what I'm interested in now. I'm, he said, I'm really no longer that interested in what brought me here originally or why Dave McClellan brought me to Harvard. My focus going forward, these are my words, not his, I'm paraphrasing, uh, I'm interested in, in the exploration of consciousness and how these and related substances can actually help the field of psychology to go much deeper than it has in the past. And uh, he said, if you're interested in that, I'd be happy to, to be your advisor and take you on. Uh, if not, both of us would be better served by your working with someone else. And I you know, kind of raised my hand and said, Sign me up. <laughs> you know, I'm happy to join you on that. And uh, so I've, I've shared a little bit of this online and in different interviews and things. But my background prior to that was that uh, for a number of years, you know, I mentioned uh, going to Kenyan College. I had been exposed through my family culture to uh, to music. Uh, and uh, my father was a pianist and a classically trained violinist and a psychologist. And uh, so I, I grew up with classical music in my home almost daily through FM radio. And I got interested in, in jazz early on. And uh, one thing led to another, and I discovered bebop and jazz and, and the beats in the 50s. So I kind of identified with that, you know, social movement. And uh, I was exposed to cannabis uh, when I was 15, 16 years old in Milwaukee. Uh, and, 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 uh, with my dear friend who passed away a number of years ago now, Mike Melvoin, 
uh, who became a real fixture in the Los Angeles musical scene. Uh, he was the first working musician to become head of NARIS, the National Academy of Recording Sciences. So he and I would go to jazz clubs. So I was exposed to jazz culture and black jazz musicians and, and therefore cannabis. So I had some experience of, of altered consciousness, if you will. But of course, nothing like what I was about to experience a week or two later when I had my first psilocybin experience. But coming back to your question, you know, my first impression of Tim was pretty much what I said a few minutes ago. Charming, intelligent, present, attentive, interesting, uh, cultured. Uh, you know, it uh, was what was not to like, if you will. Well, I understand that he was a very uh, attractive and charismatic person. Yeah. Person. And, and so the other person involved with this research was Richard Alpert, who yeah. was the Bostonian world and his uh, development. But could you comment a little bit on his early uh, persona as he later turned into Ram Dass? Mm -hmm. Yes, well, R Richard, uh, again, I met Richard uh, after that meeting with Tim. Uh, it was just a matter of time because the group was coming together. I met Ralph Metzler. <clears throat> Excuse me a moment, please. I met Ralph Metzler and George Litwin. And so the three of us were the three graduate students that were the core of that group. And then I met Richard Alpert, a.k.a. Ramdas, in that same, again, that same short period. And uh, again, I found him to be very, very charming, very... Uh, very intelligent also, and uh, and very uh, warm. He had more of a uh, <clears throat> of an emotional, um, I would say at this point from my current perspective, more of a an emotional center than, than Timothy. Timothy was much more uh, mental, cognitive, intellectual. And uh, it's not that, that Richard didn't have that. He certainly had that in spades as well, but he had a bit more of, of, a, of an evolved emotional capacity uh, more, more, a little more heart-centered, if you will. And uh, of course, later on, when he became Ramdas, that manifested itself in his uh, basically taking on the role of what is called a, a bhakti yoga path, a path of devotion, basically. And uh, so I, I could see the antecedents of that early on as I'm reflecting on it now in terms of what I'm describing as his emotional capacity. So... Uh, and I, you know, actually over over the years, I became, I stayed in closer touch. I stayed in touch with Tim all, over the years as well, but I, I stayed in closer touch with with uh, Richard and Ramda, uh, Ramdas. Uh, met him numerous times in different situations. At one point, actually, uh, I had moved to uh, to a lovely bungalow down in Cohasset, and uh, it turned out that Richard was living in Cohasset, taking care of his father, actually who was living, his father was living there. So then I saw him in another situation in San Diego uh, you know, where he, he ministered to, to my wife at that time who was dying of cancer. So I, I saw him on, on a number of different occasions and we developed a, a friendship. You know, we actually developed a friendship early on. And, uh, and then of course, you know, later on in life in, when he was in Maui, uh, my wife Helen and I, would frequently, uh, almost every winter, would take a trip to Maui for a few weeks, and we would spend some time with him there and and reminisce and and have have uh, interesting dialogues. I was, I think, one of the few, if not the only person from that early part in his life that maintained a connection with him, uh, a consistent connection. And so uh, I didn't have a, a relationship with him as a teacher, as a guru teacher. Uh, my relationship with him was as a friend. And uh, I think we both appreciated that. Someone in that position uh, of being a teacher guru often, uh, it's very difficult to uh, maintain friendships with people uh, kind of in an ordinary sense because uh, you're subject to being put on a pedestal. There are a lot of projections, psychological projections that happen. So having the opportunity to interact with each other and, and sharing some stories and then reflecting on you know, what was happening in psychedelics currently and, and other things, as well as very deep discussions on, on spirit, human spirituality. It was a, a wonderful relationship. Uh, you know, he, he, again, he passed away uh, now a few years ago. 
So, but uh, again, early early on, again, I, I, what I mentioned is that he had a reputation actually at Harvard. Uh, he was voted. He was he had only been there a year or two actually. He had come from Stanford, and uh, he was you know considered to be a, a you know kind of very uh, bright you know shining kind of new shining presence if you will, and uh, he. Uh, he was voted the uh, the most the most popular instructor uh, actually in, in an undergraduate course he was teaching because he had that he had that charm he had that wit he had that seductive capacity he had the you know the uh, the capacity to identify with people uh, uh, in terms of his own psychodynamics which later on in his role as a teacher guru he actually would utilize that he would utilize the kind of every man's story, if you will. You know, I'm like, just like, I'm like you folks, you know, I'm raised in this Jewish family in Newton, Massachusetts, and, you know, and, and all the kind of, you know, kind of generic humorous, you know, uh, Jewish neuroses and things like that, that, you know, that a lot of stories and a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of jokes, a lot of comedians play on. He had that ability. He had that ability early on. It was manifest in his teaching at Harvard. And then that you know, became part of his uh, repertoire, if you will, as a, as a teacher, as a guru later, so that his influence, which was massive on the culture in terms of a generation or more of people, uh, you know, being, being kind of exposed in his book, Be Here Now, and, and so on, and many talks and, and you know, and, and lectures and visits to places that he uh, he influenced a uh, probably uh, many of you right now here were influenced by him uh, so and that and part of that was the the sense of what I'd say is the kind of every man you know that an appeal if you will to the ordinariness of uh, and the kind of humor of, of human neurosis and how we end up creating these neurotic patterns which you know which slowly but surely tend to you know, suffocate us, if you will, unless and until there's some kind of opening. Right. And, uh, and that, that opening can take many, many different forms. And the psychedelics are just one of a number of ways that can happen, in my opinion. So I know both of them had a, a bit of a showman quality. I remember Richard going down to the East Village at some point in time and playing on the, on the, on the comedy stage. But I want to go back to Divinity Avenue because right down and and stay at the period of time in the beginning because this is you know from this perspective in 2023 I want to really get the roots of this whole evolution of this this phenomenon of consciousness and and various uh, chemicals that uh, excite the nervous system and also other parts of the psyche. So down the hall was uh, Richard Schultes, who was a botanist mm -hmm. who, uh, who uh, was in Oklahoma in 1936, sent there by his botany teacher. And how much of a connection? And I want to get a sense of the community around your five, at five Divinity mm -hmm. Avenue uh, Center. So down the hall, I mean, and you got Emerson Hall right down there. And, yeah. Well, the botanic, I remember going to the Botanical Museum, uh, attending a, a small seminar that, that he gave. He and Tim uh, had a bit of a relationship. He, he was an interesting character. You know, he, he was very tall and, and, and somewhat stoic, uh, fond of wearing like dark navy and black suits, very formal, very Yankee. You know, he had a really strong kind of Yankee vibe. And... Uh, and he would he would play that basically you know he was a, a different person when he went into the jungle it was a whole, completely kind of a different personality shift you know it was, it was like a multiple personality he had that capacity to to uh, to take on an identity that was needed in 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 whatever environment so he had a little bit of a standoffish quality in that regard you know uh but he uh was a very interesting man, and so I I didn't really know him. I you know I only uh, saw him on a couple of occasions, and, and I mentioned one one occasion on a small seminar in the in the Botanical Museum, which was down the street from Five Divinity Avenue. So when you you're asking me at about the circle of people, so 
I would describe it as a kind of a series of concentric circles. So, you know, at the center you have, for want of a better word at the moment, kind of the so-called esoteric circle, which were the five of us, basically, which were the core. Can I, can I ask you one thing about Frank Barron? He was, he was temporarily brought here by Timothy and, and uh, David. Uh, yes. He's part of this initial onslaught because yes. he was the only one who had any, if I'm not mistaken, of the faculty. He's the only one who had any experience prior to Timothy with the, yes, with the mushrooms. Uh, well, George Litwin turned out actually had experience with mescaline, and George was a graduate student. So, but he and Frank carried that torch, if you will. But I, I, I didn't mean to leave him out of the core. It's just that he was there for a year, or less than a year, and I would I would see Frank as more functioning at, in a catalytic function around the group, particularly at the very beginning, in terms of of basically, you know, turning Tim on to this possibility. And, and also, in a very interesting way, having a lot of political savvy around how and what he advised Tim to do, he was one of a number of people that advised Tim to uh, take a different approach, if you will, later on, uh, which he didn't listen to. I was one of those people to one of my, so one of my teachers, one of my spiritual teachers in the Gurdjieff work. And I, I can tell you that story a little bit later today, if you want. Uh, but right now, I want to focus on on your question. So, the the uh, have I answered that your that part of your question, Ron Frank? So that circle is is a good place yeah. now to start with that inner yeah. esoteric. Yeah. So we have the kind of esoteric core, and I'm using esoteric here, not in the esoteric sense so much as more of as uh, kind of the moment to moment, day to day. You know, uh, the people that had. A, a lot, a big stake in the game, a lot of flesh in the game, if you will. So there were five of us, basically. Then around that, there were other graduate students, uh, Ralph Schwitzgable, uh, Sarah Kinney, David Kolb, uh, and, you know, uh, Alfred Altschuler, a number of different people that went on to become very successful in their careers in psychology and other areas. Uh, and they, 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 were, they interacted on occasion, okay? They, they certainly uh, part, partook of the psychedelic, uh, particularly of the uh, psilocybin experiences in the first couple of years, and, and then, then would, played some role in some of the research. I remember Ralph and, and uh, Tara uh, co-authored an article, uh, along with myself and Ralph Metzger and Tim, on, on the psychedelic experience. Uh, so they, there was that, you know, that circle, if you will, you could call it, a, again, for want of a better term, maybe the mesoteric, mesoteric circle but around the, and people would come and go into that circle. And then, of course, there was the broader circle of uh, the so-called, what I'm calling here, the exoteric circle, if you will, that had to do with all the players, you know, uh, the, you know, the, the faculty, the students, the uh, the administration, the medical people, uh, you know, that whole harass, if you will, that whole group of people that interacted uh, with us uh, in different ways. Uh, some of, and I would include in that people that would come in actually to uh, to take the psilocybin experience with Tim. And those that included a lot of uh, people like Allen Ginsberg and, and uh, and jazz musicians, uh, I think Dizzy Gillespie, and uh, later on I actually had a psychedelic experience with uh, Charlie Mingus, uh, which was interesting. And uh, and there were and uh, Arthur Kessler, the author, came to uh, you know to have a session with Tim. Uh, many artists, you know, a lot of people, a lot of artists in the social scene in New York. We're coming up to Cambridge and, and coming from actually from all over the world, actually, from, at different times. So one of the early challenges is, is how to get this particular chemical, the mushroom, and then it was, uh, you know, synthesized in 1958 by Albert Hoffman. But you had access. Mm -hmm. You somehow George Litwin found out that it was uh, uh, up the block, so to speak. Yes. Well, we, we it was actually quite easy. Uh, uh, Tim corresponded with Albert Hoffman. And made a request, and uh, you know, a week or two later, uh, 
the psilocybin uh, pills arrived in a little bottle. I can still visualize the uh, the uh, you know the little pyramid on the bottle, which was part of the label, which was the kind of their brand image, if you will. You know, and so each little bottle had, I think, maybe uh, thirty uh, tab tablets of psil psilocybin synthesized. That, that that he had done, and it was really very easy to uh, to order that. All completely uh, legal. It was completely legal, and of course, there's the Harvard imprimatur, if you will, and uh, you know, and the research model that was being proposed, which was uh, basically a uh, I would call it more of a kind of uh, anthropological, if you will, uh, or or taxonomic approach to research. Which was which was attempting to uh, identify the content of people's experiences from many walks of life, you know, from business people, artists, musicians, uh, engineers, scientists, political people, and people in the entertainment business from all walks of life and all ages, if you will. So our our research in the first year or so was focused largely on capturing their experiences. You know, everyone went through it, was required to write a a, a, a short essay on their experience. That was just part of the agreement for it. And then we did a fair amount of content analysis, uh, stuff, you know, that activities, if you will, stuff activities that normally would be associated with doing uh, what in psychology is called content research, if you will. And that was our focus, you know. And part of the early criticism down the hall, you have the, labor, uh, the laboratory, you have B.F. Skinner with the rats and the, and the experimental psychologists and the kind of, you know, scientific, if you will. And the, mm -hmm. and the early criticism of your work, if you will, was that you were not scientific enough. But you yeah. tried, you really did try to, to work in that model. I mean, one of the things with psychedelics is that so-called double-blind experiments don't work that well. <laughs> it, it, it's 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 pretty obvious at the immediately, you know, or within the first 20, 30 minutes, uh, what's happening, and and that was too early for us to to start thinking about doing a, a so-called double-blind. Later, later, we did that in, a bit of that in the prison project on the Good Friday service, where some of the some of the participants received a so-called placebo. Uh, and of course, placebo theory, the theory of placebo is very interesting because it involves the mind and what the mind creates, you know. So that's a whole conversation we could have around placebo theory and its relationship to consciousness. But but basically, we were attempting to do the best, the kind of, uh, I'm calling it more anthropological research, sociological type of research uh, based, or or you could also call it from a different perspective, phenomenological research, basically, which is a tradition in European psychology that, you know, that existed uh, for a long time. And there were a few examples of that in, in the Western field. But you have to remember that in terms of the history of Harvard and the psychology department, which was in a different building, which was based on psychophysical measurements. So you had people like Stevens and Skinner and, and others, you know, that were really focused on on uh, on psychometric measurement, if you will, psychophysical measurements. You know, there, so there was a, a long history, and of course, with Skinner, you had the conditioning, operant conditioning model. So when uh, the Department of Social Relations was created, part of the effort behind that was to create a, a different approach to psychology that would be, uh, you know, less focused on working with with you know, mice, if you will, a rat, uh, and, or condition, conditioning theory, but but would be part of a fabric of, of an interdisciplinary model that would include sociological and anthropological and political science and other other disciplines that would interact in a you know in a in a in a very mature uh, interdisciplinary model, which was the, the idea behind it, a brilliant idea at the time. So. There was a kind of a bit of a defensiveness, if you will, or a need to uh, prove that we are a science. And this is something that the field of psychology has struggled with for ages around because of the 
so-called sister sciences of, you know, physics and chemistry and biology, which were, you know, considered to be true sciences, even, you know, from many perspectives, ec economics was not considered to be a science, but a bit of a pseudoscience. So psychology kind of fell into that, into that kind of poor science uh, model, if you will. And so the, part of the, the need there over years was to kind of prove that we are, we are as good as, as the measurement people, you know, that we are as good as the behaviorists, that, that what we're studying and what we're focusing on is as important, if not more important. So there was a bit of, uh, I would say, kind of built into the DNA, a, a little bit of a kind of defensiveness. And so what we were doing in terms of exploring phenomenology, you know, in a very classic way, which is what, what in a way, what Freud had done and what philosophers had done, and certainly in, in, the, in the area of, of Oriental medicine and Oriental philosophy, was a tremendous tradition of phenomenology, of exploring consciousness through meditative states of awareness uh, in which time would slow down and things could be seen much more objectively. So we were part of that tradition. And, uh, and it wasn't long before we recognized through, our, through, through reading of starting to read Buddhist uh, and, and Vedic uh, and Taoist texts and other spiritual uh, spiritual literature that we began to see that and, and other literature, particularly the uh, you know literature that comes out of the field of mycology and so on, we began to realize that there's all history here of the use of these substances to create states of consciousness in which the possibilities of human development can be can be witnessed, can be seen, can be experienced, actually. Uh, although be it in a, uh, what I now see as a kind of simulation, if you will. It's a, a simulation of, of the real thing, but, and by calling it a simulation, I, I'm, not, I'm not lessening it. I, in fact, I think it's an extremely important window or threshold or, or portal for people who, uh, who otherwise might not be inclined to have that kind of, uh, be oriented in that way.